Hi, hello, and 안녕하세요. My name is Lee, and welcome to my channel. Today, I'll be reviewing and discussing the South Korean LGBT-themed film, Rainbow Eyes. Rainbow Eyes is a thriller following Cho kyung Yoon and Park yoon Ju, two sole detectives investigating a string of violent murders that dredge up secrets from kyung Yoon's haunted past. Released in 2007, Rainbow Eyes was directed by Young Yoon-ho and scripted by Hon jung hye Now, unlike the films I've discussed as yet, this was not an indie movie, but more of a mainstream genre flick with a budget and wider release. According to the business zone of the Korean Film Council, Rainbow Eyes was available to watch on 200 screens starting December 27th that same year, grossing reportedly $1,797,873 and racking up 318,612 admissions, with about a third of attendance coming from Seoul. However, sources differ on whether it had a $3 million budget or it actually even made a profit. Similar to my review of bungee jumping of their own, I'm going to put a mini review and the trigger warnings for this film up front first, because this is not an easy movie to sit through and I'm not sure I'd actually recommend it. However, I will go into more spoiler territory and a deeper discussion of the subjects Rainbow Eyes depicts and how. Altogether, Rainbow Eyes has some decent performances, particularly from its trans feminine character, who is very sympathetic. In addition, the narrative draws on genuine social issues and ills that definitely need more visibility. Having said that, the film is also visually unappealing, needlessly convoluted, and handles deeply upsetting and triggering material without nuance, tact, or sensitivity. Per its thriller genre tropes, queer and transgender identities are used as plot twists, and this could qualify as some level of trauma porn. All in all, a deeply unpleasant film that is also not very thrilling, like a bad CSI episode. When considering a grade, Rainbow Eyes definitely has some problematic aesthetic and narrative choices, and the ending has similar implications as bungee jumping working against it. But still, it's bringing up real issues and is more watchable than bungee jumping, so I'm giving the film a D+, perhaps hovering closely to a C-. Content warnings for Rainbow Eyes include sexual content and nudity, but the trigger warnings are a lot, so here we go. Homophobic bullying, homophobic cops, police misconduct, attempted suicide, suicide, attempted rape, gang rape, violence and blood vis-a-vis -vis murder, transphobia as comic relief, and sexual assault in the military. Again, this is not an easy movie to sit through. What exactly happens in Rainbow Eyes? Well, the criminal investigation in Rainbow Eyes is dual and parallel. On the surface, it follows the detective's search for a killer who has been targeting and murdering specific men whose primary connection was their time and place of enlistment in the military, during which a mysterious incident occurred. The secondary case is led privately by the protagonist, Kyung Yoon, who suspects a connection between these murder cases and the disappearance of a school friend that still haunts him. Structurally, the plot rotates between bloody crime scenes and interrogations, nightclubs and potential suspects, scenes between Kyung Yoon and his on and off girlfriend Su Jin, and Kyung Yoon's flashbacks and nightmares. To get deep into spoilers, the central conflict for Kyung Yoon is his relationship with another boy named Yoon So. Both grew up together and went to the same high school. Yoon So liked to wear makeup but was often bullied. Kyung Yoon stood up for them but when faced with his growing feelings for Yoon So, sealed by a kiss, beats them up himself, tells them to man up, and then abandons their relationship. As a result, Yunso attempted to man up by enlisting right away. However, once there, they became a target for intense and systematic sexual violence by three fellow enlistees. The rape and abuse was constant. Feeling hopeless, Yunso attempted suicide by shooting himself in the face. Yunso's abusers, using their connections and money, had the whole thing covered up. Yunso, who survived but required facial reconstruction, was diagnosed as schizophrenic and discharged. Soon after, Yunso disappeared from the hospital. The three perpetrators would eventually become the murder victims of the primary investigation. Having never forgotten Yunso, Kyung Yoon feels intense guilt about what happened to them. In addition, Yunso remained a symbol of his fragile heterosexuality. This is also the source of the struggles in his relationship with Su Jin who accuses him of being in love with a childhood crush or first love, whose name he says in his sleep. Regardless of his feelings, Kyung Yoon must pursue the mysterious disappearance of Yoon Se, who he privately suspects may be the killer. However, in a supposed twist, Yoon Se has been under his nose the whole time. 
Turns out they were able to get gender affirming surgery and transition from Yunso to Sujin. That's right, he's been dead naming her in his sleep and she couldn't say anything about it. In the end, it is revealed Sujin had nothing to do with the men's deaths. They were actually murdered for their liaisons with a nightclub singer shown earlier in the film. However, when Gyeongyun learned what actually happened, he took justice into his own hands and killed the final perpetrator. He then confronts Sujin with their pre-transition connection, roughs her up, and accuses her of getting the surgery for revenge. After slapping her, he tells her to leave so the cops won't catch her, but instead, they hop on his motorcycle to flee. As the cops chase them, they reach a dead end and ride off a bridge as fireworks burst in the background. They fall into the water, we see them together, but they never come back up. The end. Considering that plot summary, I have a lot to discuss, so let's jump in. Okay, that ending. Sujin has survived sheer hell, two years of systematic rape, gotten the resources for gender-affirming medical transition, restarted her life with a passion for design, and committed no crimes. And yet the film ends with suicide for her and her lover, in cool slow motion with fireworks no less. It's a disappointing conclusion to say the least. She deserved far better. She deserved to live. But there are a number of important societal problems Rainbow Eyes does bring up for discussion, and there's still value to be found in that. If you watch Korean television, it should come as no surprise that law enforcement can be depicted as incompetent, apathetic, and or corrupt. The detectives of Rainbow Eyes are no exception. Based on forensic evidence, the relationship between killer and victim is suspected to be sexual and homosexual so the police spend their time interrogating suspects with questionable means and exhibiting their own homophobic and transphobic tendencies. Being a sexual minority in most countries, particularly conservative ones where there are little to no laws to protect someone from discrimination, means the institutions established to enforce laws and dispense justice are rigged against you. Not only that, but attacks against you might not be taken seriously or the bigoted behavior of that system's agents can double the trauma experienced. Once that's systematized and normalized, the very idea of reporting a crime becomes laughable. Who wants to go to the cops about being insulted, followed, harassed, or assaulted if they're just going to brush it off or worse, perpetuate it? Taking all that into consideration, multiply that for trans people, particularly trans women. Hate crimes do occur in South Korea, at gay bars, pride festivals, wedding ceremonies, activist events against trans sex workers, and of course, within ordinary homes, where a family's bigotry can become incredibly hostile. This ranges from verbal harassment, throwing excrement, picketing, and robberies to attacks and murder. For Rainbow Eyes, there's nothing technically wrong with choosing to depict these prejudices within these systems of justice. However, the film doesn't frame this prejudice as clearly wrong. It's more detective's banter that fleshes out the world, and I think is supposed to be funny in some cases, especially their fixation on trans people's genitals and whether or not they could clock a trans woman. Transphobic comments are played as jokes or comic relief. Furthermore, most of the gay men in this film are horrible predators, which retroactively seems to justify the homophobic behavior of the cops, who refer to them as freaks, immoral, and disgusting. But does this extend to the military? Of course it does. As this is a very complicated and multifaceted area of discussion, I'll try to stick to the film and what it raises. But before that, some highly simplified points of context. In South Korea, all males aged 18 to 28 have to enlist in compulsory military service, unless they have a verified medical or diplomatic exemption. That means, statistically, every man, gay, bisexual, pansexual, or those born and labeled biologically male, trans women, intersex, or non-binary people all have to serve at some point. Like many military forces across the world, sexual violence is a huge issue, and LGBT people can become targets. For engaging in homosexual acts, aka sodomy, with someone of the same sex, whether it was consensual or an assault, can potentially get you persecuted, prosecuted, dishonorably discharged, diagnosed with a personality disorder, or institutionalized, or at the very least disciplined in some way. To what extent this is enforced, I don't have the numbers for that, but these are the laws that are currently on the books. You'll notice that they cannot criminalize an identity, but they can criminalize the behavior they assume someone with that identity will engage in. In general, for trans people, there is a lot of medical and legal gatekeeping, 
aka when the medical communities and legal systems use their power to control who has access to primary or specialty care and services, as well as what health outcomes are possible and what costs will be in place. Very basically, this can affect how trans people can or cannot transition. Doctors, specialists, hormones, counseling, surgical availability, insurance coverage, etc. This also means that there can be a lot of legal red tape for what it means to be trans, when one can transition, and how one goes about being recognized as the gender they are. It's obviously a lot more complex than this, and every individual has their own experience and pathway to affirming their gender, but that's the gist. Suchin only enlists because they've been told that doing the one activity all men must serve will somehow allow them to man up or become a real man. However, the military is not the ideal place for this already problematic goal. As someone considered effeminate or not traditionally masculine, Su Jin becomes an immediate target for abuse. This includes horrific sexual abuse and does have grounds in reality. By the law, same-sex rapists and victims who have engaged in what they call reciprocal rape, I'm not making this up, are supposed to be considered equally guilty. When the abuse of Su Jin is discovered after a suicide attempt, remember, it is then covered up by diagnosing them with schizophrenia and discharging them. Because the perpetrators come from wealthy backgrounds, they face little to no consequences, which is also another issue echoing reality, touching on problems of social inequality and the privilege of the wealthy to get away with crimes by using money and connections. When one enlists, psychological and physical exams can be conducted to assess sexual preferences. There are even cases of surgery being forced so enlistees can fit more neatly into the gender binary the military demands, and even voluntary surgery can cause obstacles. Now I'm going to bring up a real case that brought a lot of visibility to these issues, one that even the English language press covered. That is the treatment of Byon Hee Soo. I would like to preface that I do not bring in this real life tragedy lightly. Her life and death is not one to be casually associated with the cheap thrills of a film like Rainbow Eyes that doesn't give these problems their due respect, but her treatment by the military and what she fought for is valuable here. Byon Hee Soo was assigned male at birth but underwent sex reassignment surgery in Thailand in 2019. Going to another country, particularly Thailand, for this kind of surgery is actually quite common. When she returned, she was discharged from the army. Before that, she'd risen to the rank of staff sergeant and drove a tank, and her dream was to make a career in the military, but that was denied to her. By the current laws, her operation, which she needed after facing severe depression in her pre-transition life, resulted in her being classified as having a mental and physical disability, and for that, she was discharged. She passed away in early 2021 at the age of 22, and only months later, South Korean courts dismissed her discharge as unlawful. Like Soo Jin, she deserved far better than what she unfortunately was given. But you can see the commonalities. The journey to decide to transition, the gender-affirming surgery, the legal stupidity that unfairly connects trans identity to mental competency, and down to the inevitable discharge. Rainbow Eyes is very much a 2000s post-collateral thriller. All rapid-fire editing, long and disorienting tracking shots, convenient star lighting, cool tones, and neon. So, you know, kind of ugly to look at, especially if the story is ugly too. The modern thriller genre, like horror, is also known for using queerness or gender identity, usually the non-cisgendered, for shock value, titillation, and shorthand monstrosity. While the trans character in this film is not a monster, far from it, she's a victim, there's a lot wrong here. The camera and characters are focused on the female form in a way that fetishizes the trans or potentially trans body as innately mysterious, and trans identity is used as a shocking plot reveal, betrayal, or secret in the unfortunate tradition of the crying game. Really horrible things happen to this woman, and we see it in highly stylized editing. I would even say it revels in showing her trauma similar to a rape revenge film. But Rainbow Eyes isn't even a particularly good thriller. The thriller genre is kind of amorphous, borrowing from noir, neo-noir, crime dramas, psychological dramas, and mystery genres. At the heart, there's criminality and justice, a mystery to unfold, probably violence, and an atmosphere of tension and suspense. We have to have a compelling mystery and a vantage point to unravel it from in the form of a well-realized, equally compelling protagonist. Rainbow Eyes lacks these fundamental components. The central mystery is, who is killing these men? But the red herring approach to the murderers leaves the victims' deaths as largely arbitrary to the film's emotional core, the relationship between Gyeongyun and Soo Jin. Gyeongyun himself is rather bland. 
all the cops are mostly unpleasant, but they also aren't humanized or fleshed out to the point that they're at least interesting to watch. For example, Bong Joon-ho's masterpiece, Memories of Murder, is also about a serial killer. The protagonists are detectives whose methods of investigation are terrible, but it's contextualized in a particular time where those methods were encouraged and condoned. But as a result, the investigation goes completely sideways. There are consequences for their prejudices, mindsets, and misconduct. They are humanized and given complexity, so they, the mystery, and this period in Korean history are absolutely compelling. And it's pretty damn thrilling. So the mystery of Rainbow Eyes ends up being convoluted rather than intriguing, and the protagonists, excluding Su Jin, ends up boring and alienating. Nothing really matters. Weirdly, even off the top of my head, I can come up with vastly more interesting vantage points to tell this story from. Going for which should be the obvious, why not center Su Jin, the trans woman? Let's say she returns to Korea under this new identity, and she became a cop to change the system from within, or bring her assailants to justice or to get revenge, but it's a constant struggle, and then the men start dropping dead. She has to find the actual killer, but has to work fast before her fellow detectives discover their connection. Now there's stakes that tie the murderers and the protagonists tightly together, and could be very tense since she has to investigate into the lives of the men who traumatized her. Maybe there's a scene that highlights that the rapists went on to live heterosexual lives, so we can distinguish the act of rape, which is about power, especially within the military context, from homosexuality as a sexual identity. She may have to pretend to investigate herself and reunite with her sister. Perhaps the cops suspect the lounge singer who, in this case, would be another trans woman, so we can navigate queer spaces from that perspective. Rainbow Eyes could have been so much more interesting. What a missed opportunity. In conclusion, should you watch this movie? Well, that's up to you. Rainbow Eyes is not easily available to watch, but if you search around online, you'll likely find it. The film brings up important topics, but revels too much in its mountain of trauma to give any of the characters or issues any humanizing complexity beyond the tragedy. Nuance, trust me, is hard to craft and achieve. You'll see that I didn't dive deeper into all the social, cultural, or religious and political structures that created the circumstances similar to what the film portrays, and the kinds of discrimination many LGBT plus Koreans face today. And is that not proof that meaningful representation must also go beyond the surface to truly portray the complicated depths below? Just food for thought. Until next time, goodbye, farewell, and 안녕히 계세요.